Hello and welcome to GV Face, the Global Voices Hangout series, where we go in-depth into stories that you haven't heard on mainstream media. This week we're joined in Paris by Laura Vidal, in Santiago by Elizabeth Rivera. Both Laura and Elizabeth are our Latin America editors. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by our Latin America contributor, Robert Valencia. So, this week we're going to be talking about um, the glamorization of violence in Latin America. Specifically, we're going to be talking a lot about um, narcos culture. So I wanted to first start off by asking um, you, Robert, in yeah. a couple of words, when you hear El Chapo, what comes to mind? I think the first, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, is an outlaw that uh, profited out of the absence of government presence and social inclusion in a country like Mexico, which is pretty much reflected in much of Latin America. And you, Elizabeth? Um, quickly, it's a mass murderer that became a pop icon. Laura? I think I will agree with both, with Robert and Elizabeth. He's a criminal that was made into a pop icon by media. So, you know, um, when Narcos, the Netflix series, first came out and then suddenly you saw it going viral and everyone talking about it, what were your initial feelings, um, Robert? Well, yeah, for me, it was just more of the same is the same formula that you see over and over again. There's nothing innovative per se. I think the on, the the innovative part on narcos in this case is that this is seen from uh, what I would call or what people call the white savior complex. This is a story that uh, is not specifically focused on the figure of Pablo Escobar, even though obviously he's an important part of the story. But this is uh, more mostly related to the FBI, the DEA agent rather, who is going to a country that he's never visited, trying to uh, stem control and damage control rather, in a country like Colombia that is comp uh, that is on the verge of becoming a failed state. Um, so that is perhaps the the slight difference between Narcos and previous shows that you see in Latin America where the main focus is the narcos, the, the drug lords uh, that somehow uh, mm -hmm. have, uh, you know, accumulated this, this fortune at the expense of the state's, uh, you know, uh, law loopholes uh, in, in a way the, per the permissiveness of, um, of violence and, 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 and uh, outlaw activities, you know, because uh, what you see in Latin America is the, the sort of like the Robin, the Robin Hood uh, figure incarnated in these criminals because a lot of the, a lot of people praise them because they were poor just like them and they uh, rose up from from poverty and became rich so um, that is for me the seed of permissiveness when it comes to criminality in countries like Colombia it's revering a figure that has been able to accumulate a fortune uh, against the will of a state. It's just a person against a state, a corrupt state, a law enforcement that is mired with uh, corruption and, uh, and people who are not doing what they're supposed to do, which is protecting the citizens. So I think that would be, in a nutshell, what I think that's what uh, differs uh, Narcos from the other shows. It's just seeing it from the gringo savior complex. It's just the, 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 the white American trying to save uh, a failed state like Colombia, at least uh, back in the 90s and, and 80s. So we haven't done uh, GV Face in, in a couple of months, and um, one of the byproducts of that is that I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. <laughs> My name <laughs> is Sahar Ghazi, and I'm the managing editor at Global Voices, and I work with Elizabeth and Laura and Robert and our amazing community of more than 1,400 contributors around the world to bring you stories like this and discussions like this. So, Elizabeth, um, you're, in, you're in Santiago right now, and you've spent a lot of time in, in Mexico and even in the U.S., when you see the glamorization of, of, of violence in Latin America in pop culture, in, in Western pop culture, how do you feel? Uh, well, 
um, when I see it in, in the West, because I would separate this. One thing is to portray uh, the stories within Latin America by Latin Americans, which is you know what every country does. You know, whatever is around it, you try to portray it, try to talk about it, and contextualize it. But when when the West takes this kind of stories, uh, I'm, I agree with Robert that it does it in a in a very different perspective that kinds of uh, glamorizes or, or puts the hero and the drug lord because the drug lord tells the story. It becomes the story itself. It's, it's, uh, it's a leading role. Whether it's good or bad, it's anti-hero, it's a leading role. So um, everything turns around it. It's kind of, I see it as a, as a way of, of telling a story of, of a, something that's forbidden, that's something that's foreign, that's something that's outside and try to make sense out of it. But while doing that, uh, they put the drug lords or these criminals in a very high point of view. So uh, it's a double kind of thing, because if you do that, then you forget about all the victims that these drug lords you know, just have in their bags after all this violence. But also, uh, it kind of makes sense that this prohibited kind of stories of this of this person that rose from nothing and became a, a huge figure could be interesting for the media to portray. Mm -hmm. So so that's that, that's the dual thing that I see. Of course, uh, everybody tells a story in their point of view. So as Robert said, if Narco was produced in the US, it, it's almost obvious that they're gonna take that, you know, the the, the lead role in that story. So that kind of differs from the way the stories are portrayed within Latin America and, and the West. Um, and Laura, you um, grew up in, in Venezuela and now you, you live in Paris. When you think about um, Narcos culture and its connection with, with um, you know, it's deeply rooted in the fact that there's lack of opportunity, um, a lack of governance, absence of law enforcement and poverty. Um, so how do you how do you kind of see that now now that you're living in a, in a European city where um, there is a certain amount of um, we do hear of a little bit of gang violence also um, in Europe but the scale is is so different in Latin America and and how mm -hmm. is how is it how is that portrayed in Euro European culture um, the existing violence there versus the violence in, in Latin America. Well, it's it's actually very interesting because one of the things that I I see as a, as a common element here is a problem is a problem of the youth and how they have to confront a system that that really doesn't take them into account. Uh, in Latin America, both in Latin America and in France, I would say that gangs are created out of social exclusion and social injustice. The case of gangs in Central America, for example, the Maras, the so famous Maras, that they they appeared as a result of young people that were completely they were they were kind of by themselves. It was one of the consequences of the war, and most of them, when you when you hear their stories and when you see their their testimonies, most of them they they talk about the gang as family. Same thing happens also in Venezuela, where you see that violence is it's so intertwined with the culture that it also became part of the spiritual imagination. So the life in, life in slums is, is, has become so difficult and so violent, and violence has become so normalized. There's a moment in which you don't pray to saints or the Virgin Mary as regular Latin American Catholics will do. You start praying to uh, to thugs that died before, and that people treat them as saints. So you don't think that the mainstream saints are going to understand your your problems. And the ways that this plays out in Europe now that we're having this issues also with the youth, youth that is not identified with the system, that is not identified with the with the state, that they are treated as you know, um, elements that don't really belong. They they try to belong through this sort of imagination. And yesterday was, to me, it was very interesting to see posters of uh, a rapper who's very soon going to have a concert, and he's from a city not not far from Paris, not far from where I am. And uh, the aesthetics is completely like the Maras in Central America. The tattoos are the same. 
the ideas of you know the, the guns and the even the position it's a it's a sort of aesthetics that has grown and I think it has to do also with this side of the idea of, of the bad boy being seductive of getting respect out of fear of getting a significance out of violence because this is the way that you take some sort of meaning out of what you can be in society it's not through studies, it's not through profession, it's not through community it's, it's a kind of community anyway but it's actually through the power that you can exert over people through violence so uh, you touched on something really interesting there, bad boys so how do we see um, when we when we see these portrayals and what is in real life? How does this affect um, gender roles, a woman's role in society, um, violence? How does that affect how does that affect women? That is extremely interesting, also because it's very complex and it plays out differently. Uh, if you see one of one of the posts that we published, I think it was some months ago. It was the complex situation of women in El Salvador joining gangs, not particularly as partners of gang members but as head of gangs themselves and it was also a response to the violence that they were living but the only way to escape the violence was actually to become the boss in terms of, of um, com women as companions and women as, as ideals seen from the narco culture it was something that we were talking about just before the, the hangout started uh, this idealization of the life of the narcos has been translated also in an aesthetics sort of um, structure in which women, like the best thing that a woman can be is a sort of object to be desired by a narco. So at the end this translates into a sort of aesthetics that has, uh, I think particularly in Colombia it has been really, um, it's has been really visible in the ways that women are uh, trying to be, you know, it's also the culture that exists also in Venezuela, the culture of the perfect, the perfect body, the culture of the voluptuous perfect woman, and it's it's very interesting. I know that there has been some research about that and the way that aesthetics in women has changed as a result of the of this idea of beauty and this idea of value. Now it is interesting. Let me let me jump in that the narrative of of how narcos are portrayed is starting to change to to have women as the drug lord. So there's a very good example in Mexico, um, the Queen of the South. It was a soap opera, a huge soap opera. The lead star there was uh, Kate del Castillo, who happened to be the actress that uh, put Sean Penn and El Chapo together. Okay, so she was. She was a leading actress in that soap opera that became very popular because it broke the stereotype of women being only the companion of the drug lord and becoming the drug lord herself. So again, it, 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 it plays a, a this kind of portrays plays a huge huge role in how uh, not only the context changes itself but how people want to become. So you could see a lot of girls talking about, I want to be the, like the Queen of the South because she's powerful and she has everything under control and you know she's no longer just there as a, as a trophy wife of a drug lord. She's a drug lord. She calls the shots. So there was a, that's why that software became, became so popular. And then you start to wonder which comes first. Is the, nar the drug lords and the way of life which come first or the narrative which comes first and then influences the way the the, 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 the Jews and the and the same criminals try to portray themselves. So it, 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 it's a very interesting example and, um, and then well you all know that what happened next when the drug lord fell, fell in love with her. I, ju I just want to add one more <laughs> thing since we are jumping in the conversation. It's, uh, I feel that there are different roles that women play in the whole narco culture. I mean, obviously, as in any uh, war or any kind of conflict, sex is a powerful weapon, you know. Yeah. We hear that, that, that when you rape uh, women from uh, your counterpart, it's a way to um, demoralize your, your, your adversary. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you, see, you don't see this very much reflected in a way, it, it does, uh, 
and it's reflected on uh, entertainment. One of the mo the pioneering uh, television shows in, in Latin America was Without Breasts, There's No Paradise. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, a, uh, that was a telenovela, a narco novela, that depicted the story of women in their teens, like 15, 14 years old, that you know, you usually think, oh, I want a trip to Disneyland or, or I want a trip, uh, you know, to Europe as my quinceañera gift. And what they were asking is, no, I actually want to have breast implants or I want to have uh, any kind of enhancement in my body so that I could uh, nail the love of a, of a narco. And that became in, in, incredibly popular. Now that's the role of the of women, of uh, a group of women who want to control or want to gain the attention of an narco by way of sex. Now Elizabeth was talking about uh, the Queen of the South, which actually will have an English version from the Telemundo uh, original series called uh, La Reina del Sur, the Queen of the South. But you also have the role of women who actually became leaders in real life and there's uh, you know rumor has it that Griselda Blanco uh, better known as the Black Widow actually introduced Pablo Escobar into the business of narco uh, you know drug trafficking back in the 70s and 80s she was a person who actually brought him into this business and she became hugely popular and she was very dangerous and uh, not too long ago she was she was killed in Medellin um, so you, you see the role of women in, in this whole uh, drug trafficking business and obviously you, you have the mule, you know, the, the mules and you have uh, Maria Full of Race, uh, of Grace, which was a, a very popular movie back in the mid-2000s, uh, I believe. So definitely you, you, you see different roles of women in, um, in, 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 drug tra in, the, in the drug trafficking business. Now, when it comes to music, because that's another aspect that we forgot to touch upon, is uh, the concept of narco corridos, which in, in my opinion, in my research, uh, I found that it is a male-dominated uh, industry. You see that uh, it started with uh, someone called Chalino Sanchez back in the 1970s. He was a very popular figure who was singing the praises no pun intended, but that's what it was. He was singing the praises of the narcos, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of the uh, law enforcement loopholes that, that we already discussed. And um, obviously, obviously, that is on that aspect of, of nar uh, narco culture is more male dominated. And just like the narcos who get, uh, you know, killed at the hands of the police, many of these narco corridos, many of the music, that is being sung through uh, the sounds of waltz and polka, they get killed too because they are actually revealing a lot through their music, through their songs. They uh, are putting the, the people they're singing their praises to, they're putting them in danger and the drug, the, drug deal, the drug dealers and the drug lords have no other option but to kill these people. So uh, not to deviate from the original question, and I'm going back to the, 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 the roles of gender, you see that when it comes to television, me, uh, females have a, a more active role than uh, they do in music, particularly yeah. the mm -hmm. narco corrido figure, the narco corrido genre in Mexico. Mm -hmm. well, let me just add one, one role that is really important in the narco culture, which is the mother. The mom plays a huge role here. The mom is the excuse for many of these criminals to do what they do. It's a way of kind of uh, saying, yeah, I do this for my family. My mom will excuse me, my mom, and this is for my mom. You can see that even portrayed in, 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 in Pablo Escobar and the relationship he had with the mother. And, and, it, and it's kind of a constant, too. So that's also a good uh, example of the role of women in, in the narco culture. Uh, this uh, mother that kind of forgives everything and kind of it's put it kind of in, in, in a holy grail that nobody can touch her. And if you talk about the mother, that's also an excuse for to get killed. So that's also interesting and, uh, in this whole narrative, whether it's music, whether it's uh, uh, telenovelas, whether it's cinema, you're going to see that too. So how do you see when... Um when we see these images playing uh, playing out in, in, in popular culture and sometimes as, as you mentioned it becomes a self uh, fulfill, uh, fulfilling prophecy where it may not necessarily be true but it's depicted again and again and again and then uh, a market for it gets created 
do you see some movements now online, um, specifically in social media, trying to counter that? Yeah, well, unfortunately, I don't. I don't see that many. Um, uh, I I think, um, and and it's wrongfully not seen <laughs> so many movements in that sense. Um, the narratives going going and going, and they are already going out of the boundaries of Latin America and into Hollywood, for example. Which for me is very, very dangerous because one of the things that these people want is recognition, right? So they pay a lot to be in that narco corrido, they pay a lot to have their own movie, and now they get into Hollywood, it's like the ultimate thing. And there's no other counter narrative going against that. And on the contrary, it's, you know, oh, we're going to have a new Netflix. Uh, 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 drama about the child is like, what are you talking about? I mean, why is that happening? Why does that keep perpetuating itself? Why does it keep growing? Are they, did that happen, for example, with with uh, terrorists being having dramas on Netflix right now? Because it's the same. It's propaganda, after all. And that's what, that's what uh, worries me, that this propaganda has no counter-narrative right now, not on social media, not even on mainstream media, and it's becoming stronger and stronger. That's Actually, now that now that Sahar mentions the the whole movement of social media, um, in Latin America, what you see is uh, the use of memes, but more from a humorous point of view. So we had a, a very uh, popular series in Latin America called uh, Pablo Escobar, the Boss of Evil, right? The El Patron del Mal, and um, you you saw the the figure of Pablo Escobar. And it was used for uh, as a meme. So every time, uh, you know, there was something bad going on, he had a catchphrase that said, "Come here. It's not for that. Not for that. Mean meaning, I'm not gonna kill you. It's not. I'm, it's not meant for me to kill you. So every that became a catchphrase. It's like, come here. It's not for that. So uh, that became a catchphrase for many Latin Americans, particularly Colombians who used it as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of humor. And what you see is actually turning Pablo Escobar, a, a, a very dangerous figure, into a comic relief. And you see that a lot in Peru. You see that a lot in Chile, where they had these parodies about, about Pablo Escobar. Now, I, I think the, the, the way, a way of protest for many people has not been reflected on social media, but rather on their preferences on television. Because what you see, at least in Colombia, was a saturation of, of shows like that, that people grew weary. They said, you know what, I'm not going to watch television anymore because all they show is narco telenovelas over and over again. They have repeated this formula because it has become so successful that that's how they, they, rake, they rake in the, the, the dollars. So now what we're seeing in Colombia is... A, a change in the spotlight of the of the protagonist. What I mean by this is, instead of having Pablo Escobar or having uh, uh, the group of narcos who are kind of like, kind of like the the Robin Hood of the story, now we're gonna focus on the uh, work of law enforcement that had that had actually taken down Pablo Escobar in the 1990s. So now you see a telenovela in Colombia called The Search Block. The Search Block was the actual group of trained policemen that killed Pablo Escobar in 1993. So now the stories change, and instead of focusing on Pablo Escobar, now they focus on the real hero, which is the, the search block, the bloque de búsqueda, the people who actually took down Escobar. So that has become a change in the preference of the, of the public because people were tired of seeing the same formula for so many years, so now they uh, now we're seeing a different aspect of who the real hero is, at least in Colombia. Yeah, I wanted to jump in to add something more, because it's it's very interesting what Elizabeth says. It's true that there's no counter movement, not organized. But once you get reports or videos or opinions on this, and you see the comments under, you see there's a lot of indignation. I just wonder if it's that media and us in general, the readers of media, we're not paying attention to those opinions in particular. But you see a lot of people with narco corridos. Every time you see a narco corrido in a video, you yes, you see a lot of acceptance and you see a lot of 
dedications and this is really cool but you also get a lot of comments indignated how can you sing the praises of these people that are killing us and from the other point of view when Robert was talking about the the whole narrative and the stories that are being told right now in Colombia I think it's extremely interesting how there's always somebody blaming somebody else you get the producers bl blaming people who put the money and then they you know they blame the audience and the audience blame the media and there's at the end, no, nobody's to blame, but we're all watching. And I feel that these stories marry extremely well with very old elements of the culture and very old elements of the Latin American culture, in which there's a big patriarch where men are tough. In the case of Colombia and, and Pablo Escobar, you had the big patriarch that was even more powerful than the state. We don't feel protected by the state we can feel protected by Pablo Escobar. So, yeah. and I think it was, there was a very quote-unquote funny case, I guess, when um, during the Miss Universe, uh, the presenter got the name wrong and he crowned for mm -hmm. five minutes Miss Colombia and then, oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, it was Miss Philippines. That was a source, an incredible source of memes. A lot of people were putting memes asking Pablo Escobar to punish this guy don't because call, don't, they took the don't go. It's for it, it's not for that exactly. Yeah. There you go. Come so, here. It's so not for that. This is, this is to me again some some sort of uh, they know where to push the buttons and yes, this is a new thing and it's scandalizingly violent. But I think it it invites us to ask questions to go beyond. Why does this respond to elements that have been old before the element of the patriarch? The element of women as objects, also the element of, of, of women that, you know, not only are objectified but want to be objectified. Women should be objectified, that's, that's the way it can just go up. And then there comes this, this character, this Doña Barbara, who's a, a really well-known character in the region that is like the tough woman that is, uh, you know, she's the one that takes a stand, she's the one that's dangerous, she's the one that is the good, it's a little bit like the queen of the south. So what I'm seeing is a lot of elements that come from old times repeat themselves in a more violent way. And so I wonder, um, this idealization of violence, it, it's really intense right now, but I wonder if it's actually new and, and how should we read that? Well, it, to, to your question about how we should weed that out, um, I, I think it, it goes deeper into just entertainment. I think, you know, we, you, we can complain uh, a river about why, uh, you know, the broadcaster should not show or produce any more shows. I don't think that would be the solution to a bigger problem, which is the lack of social inclusion. And, and Medellin is a perfect example of how you are able to include the poor, the disadvantaged, so that they will not follow a criminal path. And I think uh, that's another aspect that you see uh, with the release of Narcos, that all of a sudden, you know, you have American authors and, and writers and journalists from the biggest uh, media outlets in the United States saying, oh my God, Medellin is not the violent city that, uh, that Narcos portrays. So they are kind of like, what we call Columbus, they're Columbusing, they're discovering new things that have been already existed. I mean, obviously, we're talking 25, 30 years later, or 20, 25 years after the demise of Pablo Escobar, things obviously had to change. And, um, you know, Pablo Escobar has been a key figure in the transformation of Medellin. What do I mean by this? Back in the 1980s, he had this program, uh, Medellin Without uh, Slums, Medellin Sin Togurios, where he was giving, you know, he was uh, building houses for people who lived in in the garbage, uh, the shanty towns and the garbage towns in Medellin. That actually became the basis of the transformation of Medellin in terms of this is people who are living in poverty. Let's give them the opportunity to really be part of the city. And urban planning was critical in the in the transformation of Medellin at this point. Medellin is the only city in Colombia that has a really comprehensive transportation system. They have a metro system, they have a tramway system, they had uh, what they call the teleferico, which is one of those hanging uh, uh, car, uh, cars that, that bring people from the comunas, from the shanty towns, into the city. Uh, they're building uh, libraries in, in the comunas, in the, in, the, in the favelas, if you call it, in Medellin. 
because that is a way of social inclusion. Of course, that is not the silver bullet to all problems. Obviously, you still have uh, urban uh, violence in the form of gangs and criminalized, uh, you know, organized crime. But it has reduced uh, violence in Medellin in such a dramatic way. So I think, and this would be a way for me to conclude uh, my my theory is that it doesn't it doesn't do anything to just wipe off history. History is there, just like Al Capone was uh, at the height of his uh, of his uh, moment. He was a figure in Latin in the United States. Prohibition took place in the 1920s. Uh, you had the figure of Scarface and uh, the culture of drugs in Miami. That is not going to go away, and there will always be shows like that for as long as we know. The, the problem here is when, the, when the, the spectator, the viewer, doesn't tell the difference between fiction and reality. That is where the, the viewer has to be smart enough to understand the difference between the two and to realize that Medellin is not the murder capital of the world that it was back in the 1990s. I guess there's also a problem of past and, 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 and present there as well, right? Because what we're seeing with Pablo Escobar, even with Entourage, where they you know, glamorized him uh, in the depiction, and I don't know how many years ago that was, maybe eight years ago, to Narcos Now, mm -hmm. it's like it's, it's the past. But then right now in the news, we hear stories and things are happening now. So I just wanted to kind of um, end with a concluding um, question. If you could um, suggest one film or book or TV series where you think that um, viewers would kind of watch and gauge a, a realistic uh, perception of what's actually going on uh, with violence in Latin America, what would that be? If you could go first, um, Elizabeth. Well, um, I would go with the recent documentary that is actually found on Netflix, which is Cartel Land. It's a uh, it's a good good documentary that portrays not the, the, the drug or stuff we've been speaking about, but, but all the things that go around it and how people have been organized outside the law because most of the times the law is part of that circle of criminals. And so it, it's an in-depth documentary. I really like it. And upon your suggestion, I also watched it, and I, I think it was um, incredibly compelling and serious. And there was nothing in it that made me, um, even for a second, like step away from the, the seriousness and reality of it. Um, and it's, and it it did depict, as um, Robert mentioned, the real heroes, the the defense team, El, El Doctor, and uh, even across the border in the U.S. Um, yes. I don't know if I want to call them heroes or not, but uh, the um, militias um, and and gave a very holistic view of them. Mm. Um, so it was it was uh, compel it was compelling for me. Uh, Laura, um, I think I will think of a Colombian film that moved me very much. It's not it's not perfect, but I think it shows a lot. This problem we're talking about with the youth. And it's in Medellin in the 90s. It's called Rosario Tijeras, Rosario Caesars. And it's the story of a girl who's a killer herself. And she's inside of the system and everything. And uh, it has all the classic things, also that the girl is super beautiful and everything. But I think there's an element in the movie that I, that I found extremely compelling and very moving. And it's the fact that you see from inside that sometimes it feels that these young people don't have a choice. That there's... They don't know any other kind of life. They don't think they can have any other choices. And so when you have, like, you know, very easily offer this path of power and maybe influence and, and also maybe a little bit of freedom, you take it. And um, to me, it was a, a, a little bit of a window to how these things start and how these things perpetuate themselves. And even if it was in the Medellin of the 90s, I think that that could be the case of many, many young people, men and women, in Mexico, in El Salvador, in Venezuela, in Colombia, and many other places, even outside of Latin America. Robert? Uh, well, I would recommend two books. Uh, one is uh, News of a Kidnapping by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I think that's a very compelling story. Of It was actually 
uh, you know, a real case of massive kidnappings back in the 1980s and 1990s that actually marked my life in a way, not because I had any relatives involved in it, but it was, um, you know, it, 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 that, that book is one of my favorites because I remember I was a child, I was probably seven or eight, and you saw uh, the, the newscast in Colombia constantly showing the images of the people that were kidnapped by Pablo Escobar, uh, and that combined, uh, you know, normal people, but also uh, relatives of celebrities in Colombia, particularly people who are were involved in politics, and that kept the that kept kept the country in the crosshairs because you know uh, we didn't know what was going to happen with uh, figures such as Diana Turbay, who was a very renowned uh, journalist at the time, who was killed uh, between a crossfire. Uh, you know, a crossfire between the the police and uh, Pablo Escobar men, uh, and that was a it's a, it's a gruesome uh, account of the power of Pablo Escobar or the power that Pablo Escobar had at the moment, and it 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 depicts a, a very dark moment in Colombian history. Now, another book that I think it's important because, as I mentioned in my interventions, is that we had to go to the depth of the problem, and the problem is the lack of social inclusion. And, and poverty, uh, the, the huge poverty gap that you see in countries like Colombia and inequality. And I think a good book uh, is uh, Why Nations Fail. I think it's a, it's a perfect example of, you know, by Darren Asam Asamoglu, who explains uh, the difference between Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, uh, Mexico. Like, the two, two towns that share the same name but they are completely different in so many ways in terms of uh, you know per, uh, household income security what led to what we see today what the, the inequality that we still see not just in Latin America but in many parts of the world so why do we see this gap between the what we call the first and the third world uh, why is that inequality happens a lot because that is the root, in my opinion, I think that's the root of all problems, in addition to the permissiveness of, of crime that I'm referring to, and the lack of trust to uh, governments and, and law enforcement in, in many parts of Latin America. Thanks. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, Elizabeth, Laura, we're good? Any last words? We're good? Okay, great. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, it's Laura from Paris, Elizabeth from Santiago, Robert from Washington, D.C. Many thanks um, to Robert, Laura, and Elizabeth for suggesting um, this topic. I, it was really uh, illuminating for me, and, and I learned a lot. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.